Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, if you can please put yourselves on mute. <clears throat> And uh, if you would like to ask a question, you can send it uh, via uh, message here through Teams uh, to Abhishek, and he will be uh, forwarding the questions uh, to me so I can um, uh, pose them to our uh, speaker today. So uh, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us uh, for today's uh, web uh, webinar. Uh, today we have a very interesting uh, uh, topic, how technology is enabled, uh, enabling data-driven investments. Uh, my name is uh, George Christodoulou, I'll be the mod moderator today, and we are very lucky and privileged to have uh, with us uh, Malik Lee, who is a managing partner of Felton and Peel Wealth Management. Uh, welcome, uh, Malik, thank you so very much for joining us. Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, I think uh, I think Malik is frozen. Oh, here we go. Hello, Malik. Can you hear us? I think there's an issue. Uh, let's give it a couple of minutes for Malik to reset. All right. Malik, if you can rejoin. Yeah. Do we have Malik on the line? Uh, not yet, not yet. Okay, yeah, I have to make him presenter again. Yeah, Malik is here now, I believe. Yeah, there we go. Oh, so, hi there. So, <laughs> I was moving things All around. Right, so thank you. And I, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Um, I was just doing the introductions, uh, Malik. I think uh, I think you drove off right before. So uh, I was saying uh, we're very uh, lucky and privileged to have uh, you as uh, our speaker today. Uh, you're the managing principal of Felton and Peel Wealth Management. I was uh, reading um, some of your uh, huge body online of work, and you've been very active both uh, on uh, television, podcast, and also uh, uh, in um, uh, serving in, in various boards and writing articles as well. So uh, it's uh, it's going to be a great discussion, and we're very very happy to have you. So. Thank you very much for joining. Maybe you can do a quick introduction and uh, we'll go on to the Q&A. Yes, yes, excellent, excellent. And thank you so much, George. It's definitely a pleasure uh, uh, to be here with uh, the good folks at Hexaview. Um, and I love working with you guys, love love just picking you guys' brains. And, uh, and so it's it definitely a pleasure to, to, to be here. And uh, a little bit more about myself, as you mentioned, I'm the managing principal of Felton and Peel Wealth Management. Um, I've been in the wealth management or financial planning, the financial industry space, I guess now for almost 20 years. Uh, I, I never thought I would say that, I guess I'm getting older. <laughs> A couple of gray hairs are coming in and things of that nature, but uh, I'm pretty excited as I get older in the industry or be matriculate through the industry, I just get wiser. And and I, I enjoy that part of the process as, as, well, as well too. Um, throughout my building up of Felton and Peer Wealth Management, I also, I, I wanted to make sure that finances was, was inside of the hands of the masses, of, of everybody, and, and not just the chosen few, 
right? So um, one of the other ventures that I'm now CEO of as well, too, is Klondike Financial, um, which is going to be a dynamic, uh, uh, a mobile app that's going to provide everything such as financial planning, uh, investment management, uh, guidance, things of that nature at, at a fraction of cost of somebody would come to like a firm like mine. Right. And and we want to leverage technology doing that. And it was my conversations with Hexaview and my vision with with Klondike and with my current position and what kind of I guess kind of got me here today. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I was uh, speaking with Abhishek and Ankit this morning. I know you guys uh, met uh, when they were visiting the US uh, not too long ago and, and they spoke very highly of you. So thank you again for joining us for today's discussion. Um, so let me start uh, with a, a broader question and then we'll get into the specifics of today's uh, topic. Um, can you maybe give us an overview of the financial tech environment today? Uh, you know, maybe in light of the fact that we are Coming off the pandemic, uh, the overall financial markets and inflation and the Fed and all that have created some uncertainty in the market. And, and maybe walk us through uh, a broad overview and how your company's investment strategy reflects uh, or reacts to the overall uh, financial market today. Yes, you know, and I think that's a great place to start, George. Um, uh, and, and just raise your hand or stop me if I'm if I'm talking talking too much talking too long here because it's I think I think we could really jam pack a lot of information there. So let's let's address the first question. Um, what is the financial tech environment tech land space? Um, let's get in a time capsule and let's kind of go back to what I remember as a lad and uh, uh, growing up in this in this industry. When I first got into this industry in 2007, um, there, there was a financial plans, right? Let's start with, well, let's start with investments first. Well, our industry is broken up into two main categories, investment managing and financial planning, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start with uh, investment management, investment planning. How did that financial tech landscape evolve and, and kind of where are we at today? When I first got into the industry, you had to manually place trades, right? So if you were doing a portfolio, you had to go in there, had a ex fancy Excel spreadsheet, um, kind of do all these trades. Uh, you had a Morningstar back then that kind of gave you uh, the data that you need to see what a... Uh, what the beta is of a of a company or a fund, um, see what the expense ratios are, see what the sharp ratios are, the trainer ratios, all the ratios that you kind of needed to put together a sound portfolio, the earnings, things of that nature, all all in one place. So at least by that time, there was starting to have some remnants of data that that was there. Um, but the the investment process still took days for us to. Uh, invest client monies, invest client assets, and um, to see everything holistically, right? From a financial planning standpoint, um, that was very manual as well too. But we had a we had uh, probably one or two uh, really popular financial planning softwares. Uh, uh, they were more like how you see those retirement calculators that you see on pretty much every website that you go to now. Um, and then it and it might have given you your life insurance need, your disability need, but it really didn't go into too much um, uh, uh, robust things. It was hard to put in stock options for companies where well, we see a lot with those tech employees and 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 startups and things of that nature. So it it, it wasn't as detailed um, as it is today. Fast forward today, um, we now have softwares that allows me to trade my 120 clients in a matter of an hour, right? Versus three to five days uh, prior, right? And sometimes even a week, depending on how many people were, were looking at it and double checking your work and, and all your X's and O's and things of that nature. Um, uh, and then also now you have multiple platforms that, that's giving you analysis and data on stocks and mutual funds and ETFs. Um, you have companies like BlackRock, with uh, tech tools 
uh, that's I think it's, I think it's open to the public. I know advisors use it for free, but it's open to the public. I think too, it's called Aladdin, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it will it will even which is mind blowing here, but but it will it, it will even tell you if you have a mutual fund, what your um, hypothetical taxable gain will be prior to you getting your tax return. Obviously, your your 1099 or your tax document is the true document, but um, it will give you that forecast. That's a better word. That forecast of what, how much of that mutual fund will be doing distributions and what will be the taxable. That was always a surprise. Like we, we didn't know that, uh, you know, 15 years ago. So, so I think we've, We've made drastic changes, and we're going to continue to make those changes and, and grow with the use of technology and, and our company. One thing that I that I would like to address about your broad answer of of the markets, um, the news headlines, the pundits, uh, and then and then some advisors, if you will, or investment managers, if you will, they were leery or worried that technology would put us out of business, put us out of out of a job, right? That was one concern that a lot of people had. But what, what we realized is that it made us more efficient. Mm -hmm. It made us more efficient to be able to handle more economics of, of scale, to be able to scale the business, um, um, to be able to automate things so that uh, we're not doing uh, low cognitive skills or low cognitive task and um uh, and i i, I kind of want to address that briefly but i think that was that that was one concern that uh, you saw a lot in the headlines prior to the pandemic I, I would say probably about three to four years prior to the pandemic you were seeing a lot of headlines mm -hmm. about, about that but but now uh, when you look at what uh, wealth management companies and investment companies are are charging because you got to kind of got to follow the money sometimes to see how things are looking and and how you can project and and more for, and firms are more profitable now and and that's because mm -hmm. they're able to uh, uh, you know they can they can they can trim the waste if you will and uh, to make sure that everything that we're doing is efficient and effective. Got it. Yeah, and. Um... You know, whenever you're talking about uh, people's money, that's an emotional uh, topic, yes. right? You pe yes. people uh, invest uh, with that in mind, and since our topic revolves around data, I was wondering if you can uh, touch on the point of uh, whether you think data influences people's mindset when it comes to investing, and in what ways. You know that 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 and George, that's a great follow-up question because um, with data, it can absolutely influence the way that that people are are investing. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the audience are familiar with a uh, uh, an event that happened here domestically in, in the U.S., but uh, during the pandemic, there was um, a, a Reddit board that went crazy about a few different stocks, um, GameStop, AMC, yeah. thing, thing, things the, of that nature. The, the meme stocks. The, the yes, meme yes, stocks, right? the meme stocks. There you go, yep, the meme stocks, yep. And, it's and still going on. <laughs> yes, it's still it's still going on, yes, it's still going on. And, and what did we see there? We saw, we saw the most people fall victim of, of a behavior finance, uh, 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 concept or or behavior, which is called herd behavior, right? Mm, Whereas right. people tend to mimic the financial behaviors of the majority. So because somebody else is doing it, or I I'm going to do it, or we saw in the hairlines uh, the fear of FOMO, the fear of missing out, right? Yeah. Um. So with data, data can sometimes trigger our financial behaviors that we have and the human element to this data. You know, we, we, we see all the times in the movies, a lot of these futuristic movies where, where when we try to let the robots do too many things, sometimes 
they cannot just make that that human decision, right? Or 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 that or that human move, right? So so with data, with receiving too much data, with receiving data, it can definitely influence investing. Um, you have um, it can it can it can also touch on biases such as confirmation bias, which is a bias or a concept that um, you look at a certain piece of data to confirm what you believe. You're not looking for things to prove you wrong. You're looking for things to prove you right, right? And and with statistics, we can always manipulate that that data, and that's something that we have to be we have to be very uh, uh, careful with. But um, there's a lot of different financial behaviors out there. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I've been more uh, cognizant about, and and one thing I've been more trying to help clients uh, cope through is managing those financial behaviors from that standpoint. Got it. Yeah, thanks for that. And and I'll I'll tie it back to where we started. Right. So you gave us the historic uh, perspective of how the technology started and, and you gave that uh, uh, double sided aspect in the beginning of investment management and financial planning. And obviously, as the tools became plentiful and, and everyone had access to data and, and all the tools, the financial planning, on the other hand, still largely to this day remains a person to person kind of interaction. Is, is that still correct? Okay. Yes, yes, that's 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 still correct. And one of the reasons why I think that is so is because of the people power, so man and woman power that needs to go inside of building a comp a sound comprehensive financial plan, right? Um and right. everyone is different. You can make the same amount of money and you can make the same amount of money and your net cash flow be totally different right and then george your goal your goal of a sound retirement might be to travel the world um uh, my goal for a sound retirement might be uh uh to own a boxing gym you know in my local town right so so we all have different goals we all have um uh different concerns right um um i might have high blood pressure and george you might be able to run up mount kulimanjaro tomorrow you know and <laughs> so you know like so so we also have different different health things that we have to take into consideration and it's so many moving parts and so many things to consider so as with financial planning you want to take that data and see what the the forecast looks like, but sometimes we have to uh, 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 be fluent. And like Bruce Lee says, we have to be like water, right? And 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 right. move and, and move through these different these different places. A, a good example, one of the one of the biggest um, uh, uh, tools that we have in financial planning, it's called a Monte Carlo simula uh, simulation. Simulation, yeah. And a Monte Carlo simulation takes a thousand different trials and stress tests your, your data or your situation. Now, this is the cool, this is the interesting thing about Monte Carlo. You can run a thousand different trials and you can be uh, successful 80% of those trials, meaning you have $1 or more at the end of the thousand trials, right? So you could be successful for 80% of the trials. You will have an 80% 80, 80 uh, success rate, and that's the number that Monte Carlo will, will, will give you. That same example, you can run a thousand different trials, and then you can fail at the end of age 92 and have a dollar in your bank account. Well, negative a dollar in your bank account. And then Monte Carlo will give you back a zero. Mm -hmm. So a zero percent probability of success. When the entire when all the way up to age 91, you have money in your bank account. But because of age 92, the age that we set that is going to be your end of life, and you have um a negative one at that at that particular age, 
none of these, none of these trials are successful, right? So it, it takes a human to look into that data, to interpret that data and say, you know what, George, if you want to follow this plan, even though this Monte Carlo says 0%, you can make it because up until 91, you have money in your pocket and you can make it. Right. So that's just Very that's just kind of like where we're at with financial planning and kind of how we have to be more dynamic and more chat GPT ish about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so so from your um experience a viewpoint you have a unique relationship with data right so can you help us understand uh what are the things that we need to look for in terms of data before investing based on your experience yes so for for me i, I you know this is now if my mother heard me say this it, it, her jaw would drop but uh because i wasn't great in history class growing up but uh, I, I love history when it comes to uh, uh, investing and when it comes to data. You know, I like to see how certain things react, how certain things uh, move when certain situations come about, right? For example, let's take the uh, high inflation uh, time that we're in right now, right? So. Mm -hmm we were in a time with higher inflation in the late 70s, early 80s, where people were having uh, mortgages well over 10%, right? Um, some 17% in some cases and things of that nature, right? These are mortgages. The 80s, mortgages. right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, so some people will say, hey, we've never seen anything like this and how can we invest or what should we look at? Well, those are times where you can look at to kind of see how the market kind of reacted then. Now, this is where we have to be careful. Now, we mm -hmm. can't assume how something was reacting back then is going to act the same now because the same there's way, so right. many there's so many things that's in place now you know we have technology now right so right so right. so we have we have we have technology that and is doing what is doing now we have back then it was more of a our economy was was more heavily dependent on blue collar work you know industrial and things of that nature now it's more services right um, uh, uh, and it's things of that nature. When you when you go to your uh, a strip mall or your 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 row of businesses, right? You used to see someone that you saw laundry, you saw uh, fix your bicycles, you saw you saw all of these people to 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 do these things for you of that magnitude. Now mm -hmm. you will see a supermarket, you'll see restaurants, you will see. Uh, a tax service, maybe financial planning yeah. service, maybe. Yeah. yeah, you know, so so you don't really see as many blue collar storefronts as you mm -hmm. did as you did back then. Um, um, so so things are a little bit different. But so so what we look for in studying and looking at the data, you know, we're just looking to kind of see how things react in certain markets, how have they react um, in certain markets. And um, so we we try to build some charts sometimes to see how things are possibly are possibly trending um, from that from that standpoint. And um, with us though, looking at the data is just I want to say a quarter or half of the step. The other half is how much risk you can tolerate. Um, how much do you want to put at risk mm -hmm. um, from an mm -hmm. investing from from an investing standpoint? Excellent. Let me um, just uh, remind everyone that uh, if you have any questions uh, for Malik, please uh, uh, send them over to uh, Abhishek, uh, who is uh, going to be filtering the questions, or you can ask them here on the forum. Uh, it's very interesting what you just uh, said, and it kind of takes me in different directions. I want to start, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about risk and, and risk aversion uh, for, for a lot of investors and how we use the data. But but before we get there, you started touching on uh, looking at trends, looking uh, at the history with caveats, uh, looking at the circumstances. Uh, I do remember a time where, 
you know, interest rates or, or mortgages were 17 percent. Uh, and and people now are freaking out that are five or six percent, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but let's talk a little bit about uh, noticing those trends. And uh, uh, you know, is it possible to always find trends? And what do we do when we do see the trends? What are some of the things that the professional like yourself identifies? as a trend versus a, a random event, for example. What do you look for uh, in, in these events, in these yes. historical events? Yes, so so with us, sometimes it's not always as easy to find trends, right? Um, for example, let's take the tech space, for example. Um, the tech Good space, really, let's, let's, let's really start, it really started to boom, right, in, in, in the 90s. Um, and we had in the US the 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 tech bubble in 2000 to 2002, right? So a lot of tech companies went out of business. My, actually, my um, my grandmother had my uh, college fund inside of the tech. It invested oh, during oh, wow. the tech the tech oh. bubble, and um, she lost about uh, seventy percent of my college fund. Uh, not not really knowing about investing and things of that nature. And so so but and she did the worst thing that you can do at that time, which was sell, and she sold like right in the middle of the the, sell the low. yeah, she sold low. Yeah. She sold low. So but um but so so but during that during that run, you know, um rates started to go low. That's what drove the housing uh, uh, boom, right? And then when the housing bubble went pop, uh, then rates went to zero. So rates been uh, for the in the U.S. Uh, been zero since 2008, right? Uh, up into I think 18, 19 when they started started really raising it again. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhere around there when they started raising it again, I forget the the actual year. But um, uh, so so. It's hard to look at for a trend of how tech companies are going to be doing in a super heavy inflation or rising environment, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so that is that is going to be very hard, very hard to do, you know. So so uh, that, I wanted to just kind of point that out there on how we can with. And then now when you're talking about cryptocurrency, right? So so when there's a new uh, 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 industry such as social media companies, uh, tech companies, cryptocurrency, it is very hard to to find trends in new industries and things and things of that nature. So so that's what I would say um, uh, it, it, it's very hard to to kind of, to kind of find trends from 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 that perspective, but when there is a um, industry or sector that has the that has the um, the history, we then look at things such as um, we, we kind of try to look at how they performed uh, during those certain years, such as did you cut your dividends or did your dividends mm -hmm. maintain? Right? How did your earnings? Did your earnings uh, hold steady, or did it did it uh, 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 decrease? Right? And and in times like this, your more consumer staples, your utilities, your energy, like you kind of some of those sectors and 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 uh, industries uh, usually hold strong because they can pass along any cost increases to the consumer. That's right. Right. That's right. Um, where we saw typically as well too, financials um, usually do well in a rising interest rate environment because they make their monies off of the spread of uh, between what they're lending to to us, the average Joes, and what they're um, oh, getting getting from the from the from the central banks. Right. right. Um, so. They performance wise, stock wise, they didn't do as great last year because our banks are a little bit more different than they were in the 70s and 80s, right? Back That's then right. it was, hey, we might give you a mortgage, we might give you a car loan. 
Now you got our banks that are doing uh, uh, investment banking. They're doing uh, commercial loans. They're doing insurance. All these, the insurance. They're doing all these other things that can possibly put wealth management. You know, people in my space, right? They they doing all these other things that can possibly add stress to to their bottom line. It can it can hurt or help depending on how things were ran. Uh, right. Wells Fargo announced. Um, that they were getting out of the mortgages or moving back from mortgages. Uh, I think it was last year, sometime last year, they made that announcement um, because they probably say, "Hey, it's probably just too risky for us." I don't know. We can't. We can't get it. We keep. We keep messing up and getting sued. You got. You got to get it right. <laughs> can't get it right. Um, so, right. so, so those things are, are, um, and then so also with the yield curve inverted, which means uh, when your short term interest rates are higher than your long-term interest rates. Once again, inverted yield curve is when your short-term interest rates are higher than your long-term interest rates. It gets a little tougher for the financials to make money. Uh, and hence, we saw Credit Suisse and uh, Signature Bank and S uh, Silicon Valley Bank and all these other banks run into some issues and some troubles during a time where they're supposed to be, historically, they kind of made money hand over fist, right? right. So. Yeah, and and uh, he, here let me ask you this question from uh, from our audience here, right? So uh, you you are an expert. You you use all these tools on a daily basis. How does someone who has a different job other than than financial planning uh, get educated on uh, uh, what they need to do or not do, or uh, you know, if I'm too busy working a, a day job? Uh, where do I find the time uh, to learn about uh, what data should I be looking at and, and how should I be using this data to benefit from, uh, you know, interest uh, rates being uh, higher, perhaps, or what industries I need to be investing or what stocks do I need to be investing in? What are your what are your recommendations here? Yeah, so. Um... To me, it is so hard for the average person to be to be good in everything about finance. Um, for you to do that, you have to really commit your life to learning on how to do so, right? Um, I, I have clients that probably know stocks better than me, mm. right? But they don't know taxes, insurance, cash flow planning, retirement planning, long-term care. They don't know all those other things better than me, right? So so when you spend the time uh, trying to learn, trying to be, to try to do everything for yourself, it can become overwhelming to some people. You have to truly enjoy it. It, it cannot be a task that you do every so often, such as cleaning your room or something like that, right? It has to be something that you wake up every day and you do every day and every night you know every day every morning i wake up i read about two hours i go to bed i'm reading another two three hours i'm looking i'm listening to podcasts as i'm jogging as mm -hmm. i'm running as i'm driving to my next appointment i eat breathe sleep this stuff right and 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 yes that got me to the knowledge level that i'm at today but more important, the reason why I continue to do it is because finances are, it's a living, breathing thing. It has its mind of its own. You know, four years, uh, three, five years ago, nobody knew what a cryptocurrency was. Only a very few small percentage of people knew what that was. Now... Perfect. Now it's the talk of the town and everybody's talking about it. Now you have to understand ledgers and uh, and blockchain and it's a whole nother language, right? right. right. So, exactly. so, yeah, so, so, so if someone, to me, um, a lot of people will give you names of books. A lot of people will give you classes to take. To me, I think the best way to learn right now is to subscribe to about two or three publications, um, you know, Barron's, Wall Street Journal, um, 
uh, Business Insider, CNBC. Uh, now, all of these places have a free version, and most people always go with the free version. But if you want to learn, if you want to be to get that edge, you have to pay. You have to go behind the paywall. You know, right. I have so much free data at my disposal and I pay for two or three of those things. And right. if I pay for it, why, why shouldn't you? Right. right. Um, um, so, so um, if you're really serious about um, uh, learning about financial planning and investments, uh, then I would say that's the route I would go about taking it. Also, um, excuse me, hold on one second here. There's, there's two books that are really good. I gave my other one away. I ordered about 10 new copies, but, um, this book here, let me dust it off here. <laughs> this, this book here, <laughs> it's called the psychology of money by Morgan Housel. And this book is not about any fancy strategies any cool techniques, any which way to look at data. This book is all about the mindset and it's all about the behavior and it's all about controlling your emotions. The data doesn't mean a thing if you don't, if you don't um, know how to use it or know how to interpret it. I tell people right. all the time, when you go to a doctor's office and they tell you that you have to, uh, uh, that, you know, that you have to, that you have cancer and then you have to take chemo to get better. And you went to the doctor's office and you got the diagnosis, you did all the MRIs and everything like that. And they told you you have cancer and you're not doing the, the you're not putting in the work and you're not doing, you're not taking the medicine and things of that nature. So, so, so that's kind of what I equated to when you're, when, when, when really, when we have all this data, but we're not doing that, that other work that needs to be done so that we can manage and interpret all this stuff here. Got it. Yeah, and uh, so um, I have two questions uh, related uh, to to risk and 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 investors' risk tolerance. Uh, so uh, first one is: um, Do you think that uh, by educating uh, financial literacy, by by gaining financial literacy? Uh, would that help the average investor make the right decisions that if they uh, according to their risk tolerance so mm -hmm. if i'm risk averse versus a risk taker where would i be able to benefit uh by looking at the data and understanding the data to make the right decisions for my risk tolerance yes absolutely um one of the things that I've seen with especially my older clients, we call them baby boomers. I, I forget the age that they start with, but somewhere around 60, 65, they're, they're somewhere around there. So that age group and up will sometimes tend to be very conservative um, because everything, the way that the market is, is moving and a thousand point swing in the market used to be a big day. Uh, back in the day, um, but now I think people will stomach that a little bit more than they than, than, than they used to. Um, so I think when you educate people on the data um, and you show them the benefits of waiting, the benefits of not acting, I, I think that education will a lot of times increase their risk tolerance and a lot of time help them with the investment data one of the statistics that I always quote um, and is it's the average return when it comes to investing, right? So when you're looking at when someone is investing uh, day to day, you know, that's a kind of like a crapshoot on uh, or a dice roll of, of how well that they're going to do when they're day trading, right? So you have to be really good at that to do that for a living, to do it consistently and to, and to win at it more than you lose, right? Um, when you invest for a year, you the chances of you having a positive return increases on average by 67%. So 
So that means if on January 1st, I put money in and on December 31st, I take the money out, there's a 67% chance that I will, I will break even or make money. Okay. If you, if you increase that holding period to three years, your chances go up to about 75%. Wow. If you, if you increase that to five years, your chances go up to about 85, 86%. Um, if you increase that to 10 years, it jumps up to around 95%, right? And if you, and if you increase that to 20 years, it's about 99.5%, so almost 100%, meaning that if I invest in 2010, if I put $10,000 in 2010, in 2030, that $10,000 would either be 10,000 or more, it's a 99% chance of that. Right. So when you educate people on the data, when you give them that data, they tend to start, they tend to feel a little bit more comfortable. Right. And they tend to understand, okay, now I understand how this works. It's all about how you uh, um, position things and things of that right. nature. Yep. Make, makes a lot of sense. So um, there is a, a question here from, uh, from the, um, uh, fr from one of our uh, audience here, and it relates to, uh, again, uh, risk. Uh, is there a, a potential risk associated with relying uh, too much or, or relying heavily on technology uh, when, we're, when we do financial planning? Uh, technology, meaning the software. Yeah, uh, I... Yes, I so, believe so. Yes, that's yes, what they okay. mean. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, that, that's a that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I think that if you have a trusted software that's that's time tested, uh, and there's a lot of uh, with reputable sites such as BlackRock, Vanguard, mm -hmm. Fidelity, things of that nature, I think you're better served using one of those softwares than your foolproof. Excel spreadsheet, right? Right. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, because there's just so many moving parts. Um, at least you know that and 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 let's let's be real here. The more that a software has been ran, the more that the that it has been uh beta tested, tested. if you will. Right. The better, the more accurate it will be. And if it, there's a calculator or software on a firm's website um it's best to lean on it's best to lean on that than 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 anything else um i would say i've never had it trust me as many times as i argue with google maps and tell them and telling google maps i'm go, they're going the wrong way i'm going the right way i haven't won that battle yet okay google maps is undefeated when it comes with malik and and our battle against who picked the right directions. Okay, <laughs> so 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 uh, so so uh, the the same thing holds holds true with investing. Uh, as many times as financial planning tools and investing, as many times as I try to debunk a software, I've never been successful. Now, a software can do some things better, right? Um, or, or it might be missing a step, you know, and not giving you that full, complete picture. The picture might be to level 10 and it mm. might be giving you five, six, seven, but inaccurate. Right. I just haven't, I just haven't seen that yet. And I've literally probably ran over, I wish like I had, I have a count, but I probably run over 1500 plans in my career, you mm. know, and, and I, and I haven't seen that where I've seen the issue. And I tell my clients this all the time. And this is one thing that we're going to have to safeguard with our new, with our new app, Klondike uh, Financial, in that garbage in, garbage out, right? Mm -hmm. If the data is not good going in, the data is not going to be good coming out. And then that's where the human element is needed, right? Because you have to be able to interpret that data and to be able to say, if I if I tell you how many times I've had a client, I told a client to send me your tax return, and then I might get 
um, I might get something else that's not a tax return. Mm -hmm. You know, something just that simple, right? Right. Um, right. Um, so if you have a software that says upload your tax return, and they upload a draft that that wasn't final, that wasn't uh, uh, final, or they uploaded something else, right? That a review copy or something like that, but it wasn't their final draft copy. Uh, then and it gives you that data that's that you can't use. And 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 that's where people blame it on the software, but it was more. It was, it, I'm gonna use a technical term that my head of uh, technology uses, Malik. That was user error. <laughs> it's very technical. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Um, let me. So within uh, Hexaview, we have a, a data science practice, and oftentimes we'll we'll be talking with customers and. Uh, they they they'd like us to look at either structured data or unstructured data and and make sense of it right so we've got our uh you know experts within that team that that will uh do analysis on that can, can is there an equivalent of that when it comes to the investment world that we could compare it uh, I, I do think we we look at fundamental versus technical analysis. Maybe you can expand a little bit on on that. Is there such a thing where we can make that distinction in investment terms? Yes, yes. How, how you guys uh, put on the gloves and duke it out between unstructured and structured data? Um, we you will see a lot of investment gurus uh, do the same thing when it comes to fundamental and technical analysis, right? So let's break down the two. Technical analysis is your, is all data, right? Well, it's all data and trends, okay? Let's let's right. use let's right. let's say that. So you're looking at you're looking at uh um um uh, you're looking at how things are are trending within the market. You're looking at moving day averages price averages and things of that nature and you're trying to find trends within that data or those charts or those graphs um fundamental it takes it it can use some of the data um you know earnings things of that nature uh cash on books cash on hand and stuff like that but it takes it a step further it can say hey does george is can george really manage people is he a, is he a good manager right it, it's does he know that can he get us through a a a a, a uh, time of inflation during hexaview right so so a good example of that is uh jp morgan chase right i was just speaking to a client the other day and they said malik you know uh, you know, we were talking about the financial crisis and the banks and everything. And then he said, you know, I'm really nervous about the banking sector, but I'm not nervous about JP Morgan Chase. And then I said, well, why is that? And then I said, you just you just sat here and just bashed uh, over the last 10 minutes. You just tore apart the financial industry. And he said, you know why? He said, because during the worst financial crisis of my life which was 2008 when when AIG went out of business mm -hmm. uh Arthur Anderson uh went out of business and Enron. Enron and yeah Enron all that stuff like that when all those things were Bernie Madoff and all when all those things and when all those things of that nature were happening Jamie Dimon people were going to him for money and they came out on top and came on on top strong so I believe with the, with him at the helm and him being a leader that he will lead us. And I said, and I said, well, that that's the fundamental approach right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. so, and, and then when you, and some will argue that fundamental is better. Some will argue that technology is better. Um, I think you will see a difference also too, based on generation, you know, the mm -hmm. Warren Buffett's of the world's, they're more fundamentalists, right? They're right. they're not going to all be looking at charts. They're going to be looking at people buying this thing. Do I like right. it? You know, do you have cash? You know, do you, are you paying a dividend? They're looking at those kind of solid things. Um, whereas the younger generation, I would say, forty five and under, probably, and forty five is pushing it, but forty five and under, you you will catch, you will probably find more and more people using technical analysis from that standpoint.
Excellent. Great. I, uh, boy, uh, does time fly when you're having fun? <laughs> I, I'm just looking at the clock here. I, we have, uh, uh, I think, time for a couple of more questions. One here uh, is very timely. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of talk about the a global recession, uh, whether this is going to be a global recession or or more uh, regional uh, is debatable. I guess uh, even today they don't um, uh, they they don't uh, say that the U.S. is in a recession. I may be wrong, uh, but if if that risk of recession is real, what are some good investment strategies that a typical you know uh, investor could do to position themselves for that? Yes. So um, is the U.S. in a recession right now? Technically is not. Um, we have we had one. There's multiple indicators that tells the government and that tells the the, the Bureau of Economics um, that that we are in a recession. One of the signs that we saw is the inverted yield curve. Um, but that's not that doesn't tell us that we're in a recession that tells us that one is 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 can happen within a certain time frame that's one of the trends that that right. that people follow and that people see and when that yield curve inverts one a recession usually follows within 18 months i think we hit that 18 month mark um i think or 12 to 18 months i think we hit that mark recently it was, I think sometime this year i think we hit that mark um so but um, another thing that they look at is they look at um, uh, housing starts. They look at uh, um, uh, uh, they 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 look at consumer spending. They look at in, uh, unemployment. Unemployment is still under full unemployment. Full and full unemployment is four percent in the U.S. And last time I saw, we were three point six, three point four to three point six. Uh, the last time I saw it. So we well below it, right? So some of these other things have to get worse before we're officially in, in that recession, right? Um, the other thing, so um, one of the reasons, the, the other thing is that most, most recessions are started by rates rising, right? The Fed mm -hmm. raising rates. Right. Because the economy, which they're certainly doing right now, right? What they, what they're certainly doing right now. <laughs> so, so now you have the incur the inverted yield curve. You have unemployment is being stubborn and unemployment is fighting. But the, in the tech space, unemployment is getting rattled, right? Uh, in the tech space, because we're seeing a lot of layoffs um, from that, from that, in, in that, in that sector. Uh, um, because I think you guys have learned. Uh, with 08 and 09 and stuff, like, hey, earnings do matter. Let's try to protect those earnings, and I think that's what that's what these companies are, are, are kind of are, are trying to do right right now. Uh, the tech companies are trying to do so. So, do I think a recession is coming? I, absolutely, I, I do think one is coming. Um, but one of the reasons why I think it's coming is because something, George, that you alluded to in the very beginning of our conversation, and that's a lot of the quantitative easing that was put into place um, um, through the Federal Reserve, um, which was the stimulus packages, the COVID right. stimulus relief funds, and things of that nature. Uh, other countries did, did, did something similar to kind of help people out and things of that nature. Now, now everybody has all of this money in their pocket. Because let's be frank, some people got the money that shouldn't have probably gotten the money. In mm -hmm. certain business, some businesses gotten money that shouldn't, that shouldn't have gotten money. So what did it what did it do between the supply shortages that were worldwide and the uh, the excess cash that people had? It rose up the demand, uh, the prices for things because it rose up the consumer demand. Right. And so now the Fed had to raise rates to combat that because they have to take money out of the right. economy. Right. So the. The M2 money supply is the measure that I've been looking at. That's your checking savings, personal savings, things of that nature. That number um, during the pandemic year over year was to high as 20%, meaning a lot of people had a lot of money in their checking and savings accounts, right? Um, we have since 
we have since seen a dramatic change and shift where and we've seen a big decline. We haven't seen a decline in money to money supply since the Great Depression of wow. this magnitude. Of wow. this magnitude. So so I do think something is coming. Uh typically when the US gets hit, we're like a leading indicator. Like we're usually hit first, right. and then right. everything else kind of kind of trickles. Um, um, and then depending on how stable uh, an economy is uh, internationally, then they might be down a little bit more, a little bit less, right? Uh, 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 so, so, so I would definitely, so to answer that question, what are some good investment strategies? High quality, yeah. <laughs> right? So you want to go, you want to go for high quality. Well, not just specifically bonds. Um, because last year, 30 year treasuries were down 30%, right? Right. Yeah. So, 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 so we have to look at, and that's the highest quality, the safest bond you can buy. Treasuries, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, so, so you want to, you have to look short on the yield curve, meaning things that are less than five years maturity, if you want to be safe, right? Because that's going to, as the, I'm not sure if you guys can see this or not, this is my yeah. pencil here. So as the rates go up, the bond prices go down, mm -hmm. right? So as rates continue to rise, the bond prices go down. So if, if we know that we're not sure if the, if the central banks are done raising rates, I don't think they are, but, but it, so that's really, if you're thinking that the rates are going to continue to rise, then you need to be shorter on the yield curve. You know, so that you because you can have a safe bond and still have your and still have your bond price go down because you went too far out on the yield curve and the and the the, the interest rate movement is affecting your price. Go ahead. All right. Excellent. Well, uh, we are down to our last two minutes, so um, I want to thank uh, our speaker today. Thank you so very much, uh, Malik, for this very insightful. Uh, uh, discussion and I want to remind everyone that uh, we will be hosting other topics in the future so please send uh, your uh, suggestions uh, to us and if you don't mind uh, Malik just a quick one minute overview of Hexaview uh, Abhishek go ahead and uh, put up the last couple of slides here uh, I'll do a shameless uh, plug for our company here I was just uh, uh, talking uh, with our founders this morning, and we have uh, uh, we are on a roll here. Uh, we just opened a new office, or we're we're opening a new office in Pune, uh, India, near uh, Mumbai, the capital. Of course, that's in addition to our New Delhi or Noida office. Of course, we do have uh, an office in New Jersey, and more recently in New York City, and of course uh, Paris, France, and in California. Uh, and uh, I believe last year we opened another, uh, we, op we, we have an NTD now and we are opening an office in Toronto as well. So yeah, Hexaview uh, is uh, over 400 uh, developers or resources strong right now. We've gone globally and uh, of course we have an excellent net promoter score uh, in all of our um, surveys uh, that we, we do with our uh, existing customers. We have partnerships uh, with all the major players, as you can see, and a lot of our clients are well-recognized names, as you can see here, LPL Financial, Bonnie, uh, Adobe, Adapar, etc. And uh, just uh, real quick, the next uh, slide, uh, Abhishek. Right. So this is how we're structured. We offer services across the spectrum of enterprise uh, development, Salesforce, cloud, data science, and blockchain. If you would like uh, to learn more about Hexaview, please get in touch with our uh, money, uh, administrator of this uh, seminar, Abhishek, and uh, we will schedule a meeting with you. And again, thank you so very much, uh, uh, Malik, for your time today. and. Uh, how can people get a hold of you if they would like to learn more about your services? Yes, um, you can get a hold of me. Uh, my website is feltonandpeel.com. That's F-E-L-T-O-N-A-N-D-P-E-E-L. 
Um, also, um, I'm very Googleable, <laughs> so you can just type I, I in, found that out today. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can type in Malik Lee, and then you'll see everything. Everything there. Uh, I'm at the top page on Google. Uh, a lot of good SEO and backlinks. Things to use. Smart technology, folks out there. Uh, and then also our new venture, KlondikeFinancial.com, um, and that's the app that we're building, and we're hoping to change that. Hope to change the financial landscape even more with that. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for your questions and for attending. And we'll see you again soon in a future episode.